Uh, so Alan Gilbert is a local author. Uh, this book that he's uh, going to be talking about today, it uh, talks about a lot about the history of Worcester education um, and how these laws uh, with Worcester education uh, have really influenced other communities. Um, so without further ado, please welcome our local author, Mr. Alan Gilbert. So I got to tell you, I really feel like I've been set up. I mean, the last two hours, I can't step dance, I can't play the oud, I, I, I can't do any, I can't try. So I, what I want to do is give you some sense of what it's like to really like writing and to be an author. This is the book I wrote, it's called Equal is Equal, Fair is Fair. And it's subtitled, Vermont's Quest for Equity in Education, Funding, Same-Sex Marriage, and Healthcare. I'm sure that's not the exciting stuff you've just seen for the last two hours, but there's actually a lot of Worcester in this book, and I want to try to explain to you why and how that came about. I also wanted you to know that for the last day or two I've been watching myself as I prepare for this presentation and I can't believe so that was planned because the next thing I was going to say is I can't believe how dependent I am on paper and that's really true I mean if you actually look at this you can see I've been revising something I think now for the sixth time, and that is something that an author does all the time. One of the things that does to you, though, it essentially change you in, change, change you, as in going to prison, to the way that you've written something because you think you put so much work into it, you have to say the things that you've now developed. So it's really hard for me to actually do this extemporaneously without some notes. So when they go flying away, it really does bother me a lot. So let me, just, let me just talk a little bit about how I became an author, and then let me talk a little bit about the stuff that's in the book and how it pertains to Worcester. So how do you really become an author and write a book? And I gotta tell you, for me, what happened in Worcester nearly 30 years ago is what put me on the path to writing this book. The book is about, as I said, Vermont's quest for equity in education, funding, same-sex marriage, and health care, and I became, I have become, fascinated with those three subjects. I've always liked to read. You should know my mother was an English teacher, and she didn't let my three brothers and me watch television during the school week. She wanted us to read books, and I did, and I think when you begin, even as a child, to realize the power uh, that words have to tell a story or to describe a snow scene to somebody from Florida or maybe even publish a family newsletter. When you start realizing the power of words when you're doing that, you can really get hooked on reading and you get hooked on writing and that's what happened to me. When I came to Vermont in the 1970s after college, I became a journalist for the Rutland Herald and, and, and the Times Argus. And I have to tell you, writing for a daily newspaper is probably the most terrific way to learn how to observe things and then explain them to other people so they can understand them. You're writing two stories a day and everything has to be perfect or the editor really lays his or her thumb down on you. So that really is, in a nutshell, what writing is all about. How do you observe things and then explain them to other people? One of my interests when I was a reporter was education. And I think that could be because both of my parents had been educators. I wrote a lot of education stories, both while I was at the Herald and also at the Times Argus, and then later when I started doing a lot of freelance writing. When I moved to Worcester, which was in the late 1980s, I, <laughs> I, I got drafted to run for the school board. I, I didn't realize what that really meant, I guess, at the time. And I won a seat. I'm not sure I was, I was opposed, actually, um, and I dove into education politics. It didn't take long for me to see that Worcester was a property-poor town with high school taxes and a school building that actually wasn't meeting state standards. 
The town had gone through repeated votes on funding a modest bond so we could build an addition to the school. Townspeople, that's all of us, said their school taxes were too high and they were right. We were right. We were paying a lot, especially compared to other people. So at that point, I had heard that the ACLU of Vermont, the American Civil Liberties Union of Vermont, was considering challenging in court the state's school funding system because of the wide disparities in school funding. I was pretty naive about all this stuff, about what a lawsuit really is. Even though my wife is an attorney, I don't think you've ever, you really understand the law until you're part of a case or you're very close to somebody who is going through litigation of some sort. Worcester itself was really a poster child of the problem of unequitable funding. Robert Gensberg, who was an incredibly principled, highly respected lawyer from the Northeast Kingdom, he was the one who was putting together this lawsuit for the ACLU, along with a bunch of other lawyers, and they wanted to show the inequity of the system and ask the state courts to uh, force the state to change the way that funds were being raised. I had become uh, chair of the school board by this time, and Bob Gensberg called me one evening, explained what he was doing for the ACLU, and he asked, would Worcester like to become a plaintiff and join this lawsuit? And I said, well, I, I certainly think so, but I, we first have to have the board take a look at this and decide if the Worcester School Board wanted to jump into this. It took a very little time at our next meeting to decide what to do, and we decided we were in. We wanted to join this lawsuit as a plaintiff. So the school district of Worcester, when there still was a Worcester school district, uh, we became plaintiffs in the case that became known as Brigham. I didn't realize that uh, my life was about to change because of the stuff I was going to get involved in. It was sort of what happened to the school funding system. It got changed too. The Vermont Supreme Court in the Brigham decision said that indeed the system for dis distributing state school funds was unfair. The court told the legislature the system had to be changed to, to uh, make access to school funds more equal for all towns. The result was, as most of you know, Act 60, which emerged as eventually the most equitable school funding system in the country, still to this day. So if you all remember, I, looking around, I, most, of, most of you listening remember what some of this was like in the 90s uh, when the gold towns in the state were really upset that all of a sudden their school taxes were now going to be pooled along with all other towns taxes and then it would be shared equally among all the different towns. After the Brigham decision came down in February 1996 and it was pretty clear this was not going to be a really easy battle to get good legislation through, I helped form an advocacy group to explain and defend the court decision and then to monitor the passing and implementation of the law Act 60 itself. Later, uh, several years later, because of my work on that stuff in the legislature, I was asked to uh, apply and I got, I got chosen to become the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Vermont, which again had originally brought the suit. So in many ways I had a heck of a lot of uh, uh, ability or, or I was able, because of the front row seat I had, to, uh, to tag along with a really interesting story. And the story didn't stop just with education. Remember, we're talking about equity here. How can all kids be treated equally? A couple of years after the Brigham decision came down, in fact, two years, we had another uh, really nationally important decision, and that involved the right of gay couples to become married, like straight couples are. That was the Baker decision that was, that was handed down by the Vermont Supreme Court in December of 1999. It was, it was a real game changer. Uh, at first, people didn't know what to think about it or what to do about it, but it was pretty clear that just as with the education funding, the legislature was going to have to kick into high gear and figure out a way that changing something that had been in place for many, many years, if not centuries, which is you know the limiting of marriage rights to, to only state, uh, straight couples, how are you going to do that for gay people without having the state in an uproar? 
For me, uh, the really fascinating thing about the Baker decision was that it was premised based on the same reasoning as the Brigham decision. And that was that the state must provide, according to the state constitution, it has to provide equal access to benefits that if it's going to give them to one person, it's got to give them to all people or on an equal basis. And this is, this is what the Article 7 of the Vermont Constitution says, because if you think about this, it can really be used to do a lot of pretty amazing things if you can make it work. This is what it says. And the language is weird because it comes literally from the 18th century, this, this constitutional pro, uh, clause was written in the 1770s, and it's still, we still have it in our constitution virtually exactly the same. It says that government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community, and not for the particular emolument or advantage of any single person, family, or set of people who are a part only of that community. So it means when the government hands out a benefit, like schools, public schooling is a requirement in the Vermont Constitution, kids have to have an equal opportunity to learn in school. You can't have what a kid can learn, the um, capability of the school to fund certain programs. That can't be based on the town the kid lives in. It's gotta be based on the school you have and you have to have equal access to school funds. So this got me thinking about how is this how is this simple clause used to make two really important changes. First, to completely change around the way schools are funded, which was quite an uproar when that came down. And then the second decision, the Baker decision, how did this how did this clause of the Constitution and allow a second thing, which was the ability for gay people to marry. How how did that happen? What is it? How does a constitutional how does a constitutional clause that's 250 years old really work? And that's what I that's what I tried to understand. What's so different about Vermont? Why was Vermont able to do this? And that's when I started thinking about writing a book because I needed to understand how all this could happen and I wanted to be able to explain it to other people. And in the process of doing this, asking about school funding and about gay marriage, I also began asking, why hasn't this happened with health care? Why haven't we made access to health care equal for all Vermonters? This is something we've been working on, literally, I found out, for a hundred years, and it's something the state still hasn't been able to achieve. So with those three things in mind, I said to myself, I got a book. I got a book. It's got three chapters. Two of them are success stories, and one of them is a still struggling story. The real challenge for me was, how could I make any of this stuff, school funding formulas, common law concepts of marriage, publicly financed, universal access to health care, how can you make that interesting to either talk about or to read about? And I was pretty sure I can handle the research, but the writing I knew had to be crisp, it had to be engaging, it had to be clear while not complicated, and it could not be either preachy or strident. And really, when it comes right down to it, that's really what good writing is all about, finding the voice that connects you with readers. So what I wanted to do is to just read you a couple of, of my favorite snippets, uh, one from each of the, of the three chapters. And they're ones, that, they're ones that I actually still like reading myself. And I, I, it's, it's kind of cool when, when that happens to you because um, it, it, it really makes you feel like um, you've connected with who you're writing about and you hope you can connect with your readers as well. So this is about the school funding case, and it's about who the heck was Amanda Brigham. Behind every legal case is a person and a story. The school funding case filed in 1995 in the Vermont Superior Court in Hyde Park was Brigham v. State of Vermont. Although there were actually a total of 13 plaintiffs, the lead plaintiff was Amanda Brigham. Her surname, Brigham, came first alphabetically 
in the list of plaintiffs. And so the file created by the court was simply Brigham v. State of Vermont. I always felt it was fitting that a lawsuit that broke new legal ground in an important education issue took the name of an eight-year-old. Once the Vermont Supreme Court decision in the case was handed down two years later, legislators explaining a school funding issue began to say that Brigham requires this or Brigham requires that. I smiled to think how appropriate it was that a child from a rural Addison County farm town seemed to be telling adults what to do when it came to education. Uh, I think I can do without those now, but thanks, Lila. That's my wife, by the way, Lila. <laughs> The, the, much be, the much better half. Amanda Brigham was the daughter of Carol and Rusty Brigham of Whiting, a hard-working couple who struggled to keep the family farm going but ended up having to work off the farm as well to make ends meet. Carol served on the Whiting School Board. She knew how hard it was to balance the school's budget. The town was property poor and residents' income were below the state average. There was nothing fancy about the small school in the village that served kids in kindergarten through sixth grade. Amanda was squirming in a decidedly adult-sized chair when I met her in the summer of 1995 at the Lamoille County Courthouse. Her mother introduced us, explaining that my school was also involved in the lawsuit. We were plaintiffs as well. Amanda said, hello, after prompting from her mom. Carol whispered to me that she was shy. I tried to put myself in her shoes, pondering what it would be like if my mother and I had one day gotten into our car and driven 85 miles from the small town where I was growing up to attend something called a hearing to change things so schools work better for all kids. It's hard to know how much any eight-year-old can understand of a complicated legal case. As Amanda grew older, so did her confidence. After elementary school in Whiting, she went to the regional high school in Brandon and then out of state for college. She gained bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in sports management. She worked at universities in Pennsylvania and New York and then she returned to Vermont for a job, uh, returned to Vermont for a job at Norwich University. When I retired from the ACLU in 2016, Amanda and her mom drove to Montpelier for my going away party. I got it now, her smile said to me when we reminisced about the lawsuit and her role in it. It's not easy being a plaintiff in a lawsuit. Amanda has never worn on her sleeve the notoriety awarded by the alphabet. Her shyness long ago gave way to a proud modesty of a young woman whose school needed help. So that was Amanda, who I still think is a wonderful kid. She did a wonderful thing and all always be grateful to her and I think many other people without realizing it probably are as well. So let me let me read you something about the Baker decision it's in my book that is still a, sort of a, a sore point uh, among many many people uh, especially within the gay community not so much for what about what Vermont did in, uh, after the Baker decision, uh, but what it didn't do. And it was something that has been very difficult for me to explain to people why what Vermont did was courageous when they think that Vermont was actually being um, too cautious and not courageous enough at all when it did come down with the Baker decision. If you remember when Howard Dean signed the uh, Civil Unions Bill that was finally passed. He actually did it in a closed, it wasn't even a ceremony. There was nobody invited to the signing of the bill. There were no pens that were passed out to people as you sometimes have when a, a big, a big uh, uh, bill is passed. Instead it was done behind closed doors. And that, that was really kind of important of what was in store for the Baker decision. As the years passed, the decision was shunned by national gay rights advocates. The Vermont Supreme Court, the advocates said, had given permission to the state's legislature to create something less than marriage for gay couples. It amounted to second-class citizenship. Civil unions were not equal to marriage, they said. Advocates continued to push in state after state toward full marriage equality. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court was the first state court in 2004 
to rule that marriage as a legal institution could not be separate, separated from its benefits and protections. They were a package. Even after Vermont became the first state in 2009 to mandate marriage through legislative action rather than court action, its one-time leadership in the march to marriage equality became for many people outside Vermont a historical footnote. At a national ACLU conference in 2013 that I attended, the Windsor v. United States gay rights ta case taken by the ACLU to the U.S. Supreme Court right before the big Obergefell's case that later got gay marriage for everybody in the country came about. When that was being analyzed, there was a lot of hope for victory in this case. In fact, it, it did come down with a positive uh, ruling sh shortly after this conference. But at this conference, the, the ACLU conference, presenters recounted the road to marriage equality. One speaker termed Vermont civil unions law a mere booby prize on that road, an embarrassing half-step that showed a lack of courage. Ironically, sitting next to me at the conference was one of the Supreme Court justices from the Baker Court, one of the people who had decided that decision. The justice remained wooden through the presentation, and it made me feel very empty. Within Vermont, though, the view on the Baker decision was, and it remains, that it was historic, that people have forgotten or glossed over the depths of anti-gay sentiment at the time, and that the public conversation that ensued through the Vermont legislature's discussions after Baker paved the way, dangerously rocky at first, toward widespread acceptance of a major cultural, social, and to many moral shift in the treatment of members of the LGBTQ community. A marker noting the decision and subsequent changes in Vermont marriage laws was erected in 2017 on the lawn between the State House and the Supreme Court building. It's the only such marker near the two buildings that commemorates a special political or historical event. It's a big deal. So let me see, can I, do I have time for one more thing? So health care. A lot of people ask me about health care and why, why the Common Benefits Clause wasn't able to, hasn't been able to get universal access to uh, health care. Everybody in Vermont is in, in other words. And in my book, I, I, when I did my research and I, and I found how far back this broken record story goes, literally a hundred years, I started realizing a lot of the ironies that have come about, not just once, not twice, not three times, sometimes four and five, in trying to, to grab the brass, brass ring on this one. And a good example is what happened first with Howard Dean and some of his efforts in the, uh, uh, the late 1990s, uh, and then also what uh, Peter Shumlin tried to do 20 years later, also to bring about health care. So let me just read from a couple portions of the healthcare chapter. From the start of Howard Dean's unforeseen ascension to governor, remember Dick Snelling had died, and Dean had been uh, vice governor, lieutenant governor, Dean really seemed to relish the job. He had developed a list of initiatives while running for lieutenant governor in 1990, so his general interests were known. But few guessed how quickly he'd move on one of those interests, healthcare reform. He really wanted to do something about that. Within a year, the Dr. Governor, as he was sometimes called, saw the legislature approve a bill sponsored by Democratic House Speaker Ralph Wright to have the state's newly created healthcare authority study the state's healthcare system. The authority's mandate was to develop a choice of plans to create what was termed a universal healthcare system that would provide health coverage to all Vermont. Well, such a plan was developed, and such a plan was brought before um, the House. Uh, Ralph Wright was the Speaker of the House at the time, and he realized the Democrats couldn't make the numbers work. The votes were simply not there. Seeing that this was the case, Ralph Wright settled for a watered-down version of the bill and hoped that he and the governor could revive a universal coverage bill in the Senate. I never dreamed of giving up, Wright said in a book he later wrote. It wasn't in me. Besides, we might still pull it all together. For even though we didn't have a majority of Democrats in the Senate, the public demand still seemed to be there, and we had the doctor governor who had gotten this whole thing started. It wasn't to be. 
Wright explained, we were 10,000 feet above New Jersey when the end came. He and Dean were flying to Washington for a political fundraiser. Dean was calmly reading the New York Times. Wright turned to him and said, Governor, what are we going to do with the health care plan in the Senate? Wright noted Dean's response in one sentence, quote, he barely looked up from his reading and he nonchalantly answered, nothing, it's dead. That's it? It's dead? Ralph Wright said. Two years of grinding and fighting and it's dead? Everything went out of my mind as the only visual I had was the governor in a hospital room pulling another sheet up over a patient's face and turning to look at the charts on the patient in the next bed. So almost exactly 20 years later, the same thing happens with Peter Shumlin. After his election, his 2010 election, Shumlin got to work immediately on his agenda with health care at the top of his list. In the first session of his tenure, the legislature passed a comprehensive bill that created an independent health care regulatory board, Green Mountain Care Board. The law assigned the board specific responsibilities and uh, Anya Rader Wallach, a veteran of healthcare reform efforts and a well respected uh, person in New England healthcare circles, was chosen to lead the five member board, and the board plunged into its work. High hopes. But by December 2040, I'm sorry, 2014, Shumlin decided it wasn't to be. After three years of study and extensive modeling, his administration could not get single payer, the plan the governor had promised, to work. The money just wasn't there, Shumlin said. Efforts would continue on specific, smaller pieces of health care reform, but building a system where everybody was in and everybody was guaranteed care through a publicly financed system was not going to happen. The announcement of the second death of single payer and of protesters' state house disruption were overwhelming evidence that Shumlin couldn't keep his promises. He saw where, he, where his dropping of the health care ball had landed him. In July 2, 2015, he announced his, he wouldn't run for re-election in 2016. One governor is pulling the plug on health care reform in 1994, another in 2014. Despite the interest and the energy around the health care issue, nothing seemed to have changed in 20 years. And indeed, not a some things have changed in 100 years, but not what we really want. So I'll stop there. I've had a lot of satisfaction in writing a book like this. It's not very long. I do have copies. I'll be back at the Green Ten, as we call it, by the, uh, by the Historical Society after I'm done here, uh, if anybody has any questions or if they'd like to get a copy of the book. So thanks for being here, and thanks for listening. Time for Mr. Alan Gilbert, <laughs> local author. Thank you, Alan. Well, welcome everybody. We have had an amazing turnout, and it just kind of keeps kind of flowing in and flowing out. We appreciate you all. We have um, a new local singer songwriter coming up. We're going to get her on stage. Her name is Sarah Bell. She and her family have uh, relocated to Worcester, and uh, we, we love having them for sure. Actually, um, they have a a beautiful booth over there um, and uh, so you can visit that I'll tell you a little bit more about that but we're gonna get her uh, plugged in and just in a couple minutes you'll be hearing the music of Sarah Bell thank you yes. all right so we're gonna get back to some get back to some music here Sarah Bell we were just hanging out backstage and she has been on a long spiritual journey. She's a mother of two, Maisie and Thatcher. Hey, Thatcher. There's Thatcher right there. He's be, he'll be signing autographs along with his mama a little bit later. And uh, partner Drew is out there. They have a tent that is travel well. Please check out their art out there. And um, she also has a wellness practice, a uh, very diverse young gal but uh, my favorite thing that she said is through her music that she's new to within the past six months is that she believes she would believes that she would like to bring healing to people through her music 
So on that note, please welcome to the Worcester Arts Fest, Sarah Bell. Thank you guys, thank you. Well, I'm super excited to be here. I mean, this is like super fancy. Look what we've created. This is amazing. Okay, we're just gonna thank the rain. Thank you, rain. <laughs> thank you, we need the rain. It was really dry. We need from just this very long, windy, spiritual journey, um, and just honestly just back to self, back to love, back to connection um, with, you know, yourself and each other. Um, so I'm just excited to share them with you guys. Um, I've been playing out a little bit more, like Chad said too, I, um, I, I've played a lot, like my whole life, but honestly in front of people, it's been like the last six months. So um, <laughs> thank you guys for listening. Um, this first one I'm going to play for you um, is kind of about that process, just exploring um, our fears. Um, and I, I realized I kind of kept digging into what I was afraid of, what was holding me back from things in my life. And I just kind of dug and dug and dug and realized that the only thing holding me back was myself and that there was really nothing to be afraid of. It's just a perspective. So on that note, here's my first one for you. Do I dare to the depths of my feet? And all the fairies me. Love 
走了你。Little love is all I need. Little love is all we need. Little love is all we. So this next one, um, this next one's called Lady Bird. Um, my children really love Lady Bird, and you're probably wondering who the heck Lady Bird is. Um, it was our RV, and we named her Lady Bird. Um, <laughs> so we kind of had a pretty long journey, like finding our way to Worcester. We've only been here for a couple years, and we are so dang grateful. We love it here so much. Um, I feel like this place kind of just sucked us in just pulled us in and we didn't really realize how much we needed Worcester but goodness she has been good to us um, so this song is about Lady Bird um, who we lived in for a brief uh, period of time before moving here we sold our yurt back in upstate New York don't kill me um, <laughs> near Lake George um, and we were pretty much looking coast to coast for a new home and uh, Lady Bird at the time was kind of our, our salvation, our like little getaway, our freedom. Um, so then we found ourselves in beautiful little Worcester and I will never leave. <laughs> this place is so special. Um, yeah, so this is a song about Lady Bird and like I said, she kind of became our, our symbol of freedom and newness and sometimes when we have to let things go, let old dreams go. Um, there's some things that we need to cling to, I think, to like find our new dreams. Um, so that's what that's what this song's about. Just as long as it's two 
not away from that labor. And if you're looking for love in a little bit of dirt, place and rest your head where you don't get hurt, get yourself labor. Fly it to the edge of the It's okay to walk, okay to run, just as long as it's too not away from that labor. If you're looking for love and a little bit of dirt, place to rest your head where you don't get hurt, get yourself labor. Fly to the edge of the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We grew flowers in pots by the edge of the swamp, making white in the cover on the left of the top, and that that labor. With the smell of the leaves breaking under our feet, no shape but the pine and the last of the bees we found. Long bitter. Thanks to that lady. Thank you guys for listening. Just a gentle little song. Uh, all right, what next? What next for you guys? Oh, I know. This one's a little more upbeat. Take off your mask for you. Take off your clothes and think this is worth for you before. But this heart doesn't jump the same as yours. So I want to see you. Trying to win the battle of logic, the labor of love is high like a 
This one I wrote for my hubby of 11 years. Um, I always like to joke that like in our family, I am like the chaos, like I'm like the tornado that like, you know, rips through the household or whatever. Like that, I'm, that's me. Um, and Drew, I'm an Aries as well, which probably explains some things. Um, but, but my husband, my gentle Pisces husband, he's just my calm. He's like, he's like the anchor for me. Um, so I wrote this song a while ago, uh, actually many years ago I started this song with that kind of thought process of me just being like, I'm the wild one in our family and you're just like, you're the calm. Um, and I couldn't finish it for the longest time. And just recently I finished it and the end of the song is kind of like his, what, my, what I perceived his um, response to me would have been. Um, as far as me being like, I'm the wild one, I'm the reason everything's chaotic sometimes. <laughs> And that his response um, with his sweet, gentle self. So that's what this one's called. It's called Hold Me Down. No, <laughs> my calm, no, my brain still saves me. Whips around in my calm, forever holding me down. Please hold me down. Because you really were beautifully. And when Keep from burning through 
through oh, burning you you keep the sun and when the flame oh, thinks your name I'm going to burn cause you're my car If you guys ever wanted to find out where I'm playing next, you can check it out there. Uh, thank you. Have a great day, guys. That's Sarah Bell. How about you for Sarah Bell? Amazing. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. We, uh, we're just going to keep it rolling and bring, uh, bring up. We're going to get them kind of dialed in sound-wise. Um, 
Uh, we're gonna bring up Michael Close in a little bit and uh, get him, and, and he's gonna, a special guest with his daughter Rosie is going to join him for a song. So we're excited to have Michael and Rosie and uh, coming up in just a, just a minute or so. So stay tuned here. All right. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Uh, you might recognize this gentleman or maybe even this young one right here. Michael Close is, uh, is one of the teachers. He's multifaceted. One of the teachers, of course, over at Doty, uh, but also teaches the cello. I have also had the pleasure of having Michael. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Uh, they play, I know they have groupies. The pleasure of, of having Michael play with my band and putting together a string quartet. And uh, so it's wonderful that he's got Rosie jamming with him. So please welcome Michael and Rosie Close. <laughs> everybody thinks of when they think of cello. Thank you. 
Spanish madrigal. I'm going to play a madrigal as a piece for several different. A madrigal is a piece for several different voices, um, usually four or more parts. And uh, uh, this piece, okay. Uh, in this piece, I tried to put all those voices into one. something that you would use with an electric guitar, but you can do it with any instrument. And what a looper does is basically record instantly and then plays back. So you can create layer upon layer upon layer of sound 
until you're your own cello choir. So um, let me just give a little. I'll give a little demonstration. Oh, yeah, so I turn on the amplifier now. That's fairly good. <laughs> I wrote for full orchestra with a bass soloist voice and um, it was a, a work called a, a Child's Book of Animals. Six different songs about six different animals um, and let's we'll see if you can guess which animal this is. Any guesses? Seagull. Seagull, you got it. <laughs> there it is. This is the seagull.
Mr. Michael Close and daughter Rosie. Awesome. We'll reset the stage here, and uh, upcoming is uh, poet Rick Agron, and uh, he's going to have some poems. We also have a special guest poet as well, but I'm not going to tell you who that is, because then it wouldn't, it would ruin the special guest uh, element of it. So there you have that. But uh, you, you have happened upon or, or meant to come to the Worcester Arts Fest. It's the very first one. My name is Chad Hollister, and I just want to put a huge thanks out to the whole team that uh, David Book had this idea and said, what do you think about it? And we said, it sounds great. And then he said, do you want to help? And we said, um, okay. And uh, so the whole team has just been really, really awesome. And, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll certainly mention all of them uh, before the end of the day. But um, just want to thank everybody for, you know, coming out and supporting local music and art and poetry and, and reading and, and history, exactly. Um, so uh, give me one brief second here. All right. Thank you for that brief pause there. <laughs> Had to get rid of an amp and a looper. So Rick Agrin, I've known, um, I've known him for a bit. Uh, lives above the post office, always a kind face. And uh, also, he, he's pretty cool too because he rides a motorcycle. And I uh, always like seeing him going out for rides. I dream of one day my wife um, saying, you know, honey, let's, let's get a Harley Davidson. And uh, she's, she's giving me the big negative that's never gonna happen, honey. But whatever, you can, you can have dreams, right? So Rick is a poet, a teacher, a radio producer who works helping kids of all, of all ages uh, with their reading and writing. He loves the, so the sounds of human voices in sadness and joy. Folks of the Worcester Arts Festival, please welcome to our stage, Rick Agrin. Not as tall as Chad. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start with uh, an, invoca in con an invocation of sorts. There is a place where marigolds fly from the tips of our fingers, golden orange sparkles of light, where silver blue waves crest and roll from shore to shore in our bathtubs. Each face we see gentles in our presence, red maple leaves, the purest of love notes slide under our doors. There is a place where stumbling at the end of a sentence is holy. A place where everything is cured by kissing it hello. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not customary to clap after every poem, I don't know, but you see, feel, if you feel it, go for it. But. Um, I lived in Plymouth, New Hampshire on a hill above the Pemigewasset River and had a beautiful forsythia bush 
and uh, it was in bloom, this big dome. And uh, I looked out my kitchen window one day and there's a tricycle parked next to it. And I'm like, hmm, wonder what's going on in the neighborhood. And uh, so I sort of walked out there and uh, a little girl had climbed under it and was laying on her back under the Versithia bush and was weeping. And I was like, I don't think I'm gonna talk to her right now. I think this calls for some privacy. For Scythian. Crawling under the golden dome of drooping winter burnished branches, blue skyfuls of minuscule yellow trumpets, gold finches winging back and forth above her, singing potato chips, potato chips, potato chips. The hollow of her small ribs, the pounding of her heart, under the golden dome of weeping, a leaky umbrella under which all her sadness spends itself. And after about 10 minutes, she hopped on her trike and rolled down the hill. <laughs> My book is Crow Milk. It's officially out of print, sadly, but um, um, you can find it on eBay sometimes, or Amazon will sell it to you for a dollar forty-nine, or seventeen ninety-five, or one hundred and forty-five dollars if it's signed. It's just that's that's capitalism, folks. But uh, I grew up. Um, for a few years by a giant cornfield, and I often woke to the crows in the morning singing <clears throat> crow milk. You might say crows watched over me, taking turns walking the rails of my crib, singing, heads bobbing, black throats rippling. At sunrise, they carried me wild purple grapes. We shared black raspberries on the thorn in the evenings. A mesh of sugar in our voices wove us loosely into a family. over on the, on the wings. <laughs> Shoes of one's own choosing. When I met a woman with one blue eye and one green eye, I knew her life like my own. I have different sized feet. One small foot and one smaller foot leave me rocking back and forth like a boy with a big decision. The shoes that fit I wear forever, while the ones that don't I hobble around in. I never know which foot will do the sacrificing until it's doing it. Sometimes I can hide it the way I skip or glide, but if you know me, you can tell my dance from my limp. So I lived in Seattle for three years, and uh, when I first got there, someone told me, if you're walking down the street and it starts pouring, you just walk into a store and say, I left my black umbrella here, and they'll hand you one. And I'm like, that sounds very Seattle. So I tried it, and it works. It's, it's pretty cool. On a rainy day, black umbrellas on a rainy day in Seattle, stumble into any coffee shop and look wounded by the rain. Say, last time I was in, I left my black umbrella here. A waitress in a blue beret will pull a black umbrella from behind the counter and surrender it to you like a sword at your knighting. Unlike New Englanders, she will never ask you to describe it, will never ask what day you came in. She's intimate with the rain and its appointments. Look positively reunited with this black umbrella and proceed to Belltown and Pike Place, sip a cappuccino at the Cowgirl Luncheonette on First Ave, visit Buster selling tin salmon silhouettes. 
undulant in the wind, nosing ever into the oncoming, meandering watery worlds like you and the black umbrella, the one you will lose on purpose at the day's end, so you can go the way you came into the world, wet looking. <laughs> Now, the days of this game are over, I'm sad to say, but I enjoyed catch em and kiss em in fourth grade, I must admit. Um, we do not chase little girls, and little girls do not chase us, and um, anyway. Um, I have, a, I have an adopted sister, and I chased this little girl named Nancy, who this poem is for, and I had such a crush on Nancy that when we adopted my sister and had the family meeting, I, I said, uh, like, I want, I want, Nancy's a great name, let's do Nancy, and I got outvoted three to one, it was Susan, they called her Susan, and when my sister showed up, her name was Nancy, and they decided, well, we can't confuse her, we'll call her Nancy Susan, so. It's kind of an aside, but to Nancy, who taught me catch him and kiss him. The day she slowed down, her red hair streamed behind her as she ran, tickling my face. Nancy was the fastest, most beautiful girl. I had only chased her once before without catching her, weaving through jump ropers and kickball players. We ran off the tar into the grass. Spring's hot buzz made my breath come harder. A trickle ran down the side of my face. Arm outstretched, my fingers barely touched her red hair, and then she was in my arms offering me her cheek, hot and flushed pink with a rouge of exuberance. I tasted the salt on my lip. She bent to pull up her knee sock, and with bells ringing, we walked side by side to our classroom door. I let her go before me in line, just so I could look at her hair one more time. Here's for the, the moms and dads who are making kids' lunches on Monday morning. <clears throat> Cakes continue to rise. A pancake with its burnt side down is still burnt. No amount of syrup can hide it. And the heel of the stale white bread is not camouflaged inside the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I've jumped in front of the oven. Cakes never fall as you've always threatened and bologna is not enhanced by frying it. Spee um, spoon feed me a rich tapioca of truth. I swear I can take it. Help me cut my uncertainties into littler pieces. You've always been afraid I'd choke. Give me the lollipop of life, and I promise I will run with it in my mouth. <laughs> This is a little one, and it's a true story. Unseen Toreador. Black bull charging every red leaf falling from a sugar maple. I was on my way to the airport in Manchester, New Hampshire, and there was a red maple, and leaves were falling, and there's this big black bull, like in a suburban neighborhood running around in circles around this tree. I'm like, I would love to stop and know more about this, but I got a plane to catch. <laughs> the Brazier Salesman's Day Off. Traveling the countryside with a suitcase full of underthings, the brassiere salesman looks forward to his day off. Away from the crinkle of eager fingers tear tearing cellophane, releasing the smell of fresh cotton starch and sizing. Away from the girdles that tuck the tummy and thigh, shaping exquisite womanhood into what it is not. 
Away from the cross your heart models that lift and separate, mixed up with Victorian models that rein you in. Breasts and bottoms meanly mean breasts and bottoms mean only work to him, and pulchritude is only so much packaging. On his day off, his wife and he go up by the falls. They have a picnic on the blanket and catch small trout. He undresses her at night with sure, clean hands, and he never fumbles with her buttons or clasps. <laughs> That's the raciest it is, I promise. <laughs> This is a poem that, that launched my kids' book. I'm also a kids' book author. I have a book called Pumpkin Shivaree, which is the story of a little pumpkin who's afraid to get carved. But this is, this is the, uh, the older version that the poem got read on, on public radio, and then elementary school teachers started saying, is that a kids' book? Is that a kids' book? And I was like, I need an illustrator pronto. And it actually it took us about 10 years from the birth of this poem to a kid's book, but we pulled it off and I, I got to publish that book and read it to almost 3,000 kids one, one year. It was awesome and uh, helped them with their reading and writing and that's how I got involved with the Children's Literacy Project and uh, over in Waterbury that serves under, served rural schools in Vermont and New Hampshire. and. I'm a poet in the schools for the Vermont and New Hampshire Arts Councils and really love doing that creative work with kids and their teachers, teaching teachers how to teach poetry and teaching kids how to play with language. Shivaree, S-H-I-V-A-R-E-E, -E, is a, it's kind of a racket. Uh, if you've ever done uh, uh, pots and pans at midnight on New Year's, you made a big racket that's like a shivaree or jumped out from behind a couch and yelled surprise and made a big racket. That's a shivery. Deep in the leaves, minding my own business, and along comes this young farm girl. Her eyes are blue as cornflowers, like cutouts, and the sky comes through the back of her head. Her knife shines in the sun, and I am picked. Pronounced cute and perfect, and off I go. My insides feel funny, she's pulling them out. Her knife is sharp, but her hands are warm. She cuts me some eyes that I'd been missing. I see the orchard out back, apples bowing the branches. I see how happy I make her, she fairly glows. She cuts me a nose, and I smell fall leaves, the rose and her perfume, and corn ripening. She cuts me some ears, I hear a brook running over its stones, a horse in the pasture, browsing cricket song in the grass. Lastly, she cuts me an ear-to-ear -ear grin, and I find I'm pretty pleased I ain't no pie. <laughs> With a candle inside, I'm nice and warm. There's a seed left in me, and it's starting to itch. <laughs> so much. I have uh, two more poems and then I want to um, welcome Katie Spring up to read uh, a poem. She, I was just going through the booths and she's got all kinds of beautiful art there and this beautiful poem that I've, I've seen before go by. It's a, it's a gorgeous love poem. And I'd love to have her read that for you. This one's about trying to uh, stay out of trouble. Actually, this will be the last one. When the radio starts, when trying, when trying. When the radio starts playing my screams, I try to turn it down low, low, so it becomes a hum, an undertow a home. When the car starts driving me home, I try and turn off, try to single at the junction, try and break the rear view and forget where I've been. When a sugar pumpkin asks me for kisses, I put on orange lipstick. 
I smile at the candle flame. I hear the green of the seeds calling. When my shadow starts walking backwards, tries to get behind me and smile at trouble, I try and keep an eye on him, try and walk with my back to the sun. When a crow tries to put his shadow on me, I try and let my wings show, try and walk four-toed, try to sing a lullaby as fast as, try and sing a lullaby as best as I can. Thanks so much. Katie's a poet, artist, and neighbor, and uh, writes a, a hell of a love poem. Um, I'm so delighted to be up here, and so thank you, Rick, for the nice surprise invitation. Um, so this poem I wrote is in my little chapbook called When This Is Over, which I have over at my booth. Uh, but they are all poems I wrote during uh, the, the first year of the pandemic. And this is called To Make a Meal. We began this meal with seed catalogs and tea, dreaming nourishment. Spring came, rain and mud. You bent in the greenhouse, you a moving prayer. Summer, crops mining, blooming, ripening. Roots hold to soil as we weed. This is what they don't tell you, how much you'll pull out, how much space growth needs wheelbarrows of weeds so onions can bulb so we can chop and saute and now the harvest another prayer thank you roots leaves fruits flowers and now the table barely room to place a glass we finally eat what a nice surprise from katie sterling katie Thank you. As we well as we well know, the uh, proprietors of Goodhart Farm, and I look over there and I see our friend Edge and uh, Katie, and um, and uh, of course we love having your amazing farm store in, in what used to be another institution, the Post Office Cafe, and uh, you just have uh, jumped in there and uh, brought this amazing community vibe, um, which it doesn't get much more community than farming and uh, community. So thank you, thank you. So welcome everybody. Um, thanks, huge thanks to Rick Agron. What a, what, a, what a way to deliver a poem, right? Yeah. Thanks everybody. We still have lots more to go. And um, we are going, um, we're going to bring up, uh, we're going to get her dialed in. Ambiana Gavin is coming up to sing some of her songs on piano and vocals. And uh, so uh, stay tuned for that coming up just within a couple minutes. So stick around here. We are heading all the way till the 8 p.m. hour here at the uh, Worcester Arts Fest. No, it's not going to go that late. But uh, if for some reason you have friends that uh, haven't come down yet, give them a jingle. You can get service right out there and say, come on down, because there's still plenty more. And uh, please visit all your artists, buy and support local art made right here in Worcester, Vermont. And uh, coming up is Ambiana, so stick around. Thanks. <laughs> 